Welcome back to our series called I Believe as we walk through the truths of our faith we find in Scripture that we confess when we confess this ancient creed, this 2,000-year-old creed that we call the Apostles' Creed that goes all the way back to the time of the Apostles. And so we've made our way to the Holy Spirit. We actually began his work last week as we kind of flipped things around, but we're, we're on that phrase, I believe, in the Holy Spirit today. So I encourage you um, to take stuff from this home. If, if you have our app downloaded, Divine Savior Church app, and you go to the Delray Beach page right in the front, you're going to find um, sermon notes. And if you click on that, you can fill on notes and, and follow along. You can also access the text there. Or if you're like, you know, if, if you like old school, there's the, the, you have the notes right next to you on one of those cards. You can take notes um, and bring that home with you um, and hopefully help you get more out of this. That's our prayer that you would get um, a lot out of your time in the Bible this morning with us. So we're going to just begin, um, going to get you going with, I, I'm going to guess, I'm going to guess you've heard this song before. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to speak my way through the lyrics of this song. I'm going to guess you've heard it before. I'm going to guess that most of you are going to start singing it in your head, and it might stick there the rest of the day. So here we go. When I'm stuck with a day that's gray and lonely, I just stick out my chin and grin and say, the sun will come out tomorrow. So you got to hang on till tomorrow, come what may, tomorrow, tomorrow, I love you tomorrow, you're always a day away. You might recognize that as the theme song from the musical Annie. I was not going to sing it and not even attempt in any way to inflect my voice to make it sound like I was singing it so that you could be angry with me later today when that song is going through your head. This song has a lot of hope and optimism bursting forth from a very unlikely character, doesn't it? Because Annie, the orphan, doesn't know who her parents are. are. Um, she doesn't know why she's an orphan. She be, she's treated awfully by mean Miss Hannigan, um, and yet she sings this very hopeful and this very optimistic song uh, for being an orphan living in terrible conditions. It's a lot of optimism for an orphan. I'm starting with that because the, the truth is, wh where we have to start with this, is that you and I were born as spiritual orphans into this world. And so I want to, we're going to really answer the question today, how can we, you know, Annie had optimism for tomorrow. How can we have optimism as spiritual orphans? Well, we confess in this creed, we confess as Christians, we confess that we believe in the Holy Spirit, What's all behind that? What, what does that mean, that we believe in the Holy Spirit? So we're going to walk through, we're going we're gonna to do some teaching today, all right? Isaiah 59, verse 2 says, But your iniquities, that's another word for sins, your sins, your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. An orphan like Annie never saw her parents, did, didn't hear them, didn't, they, she was separated from them. An orphan is separated from their parents, separated from their family. And we were separated from God. But this one you probably heard, John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So God brought us back together by everything he did for us through Jesus. And how do we get that? Everyone who believes in him. Everyone who believes. So we have to have faith in what Jesus did for us. Romans 10, 17, where do we get this faith, right? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word of Christ. So hearing the Bible, hearing the gospel message, the message about Jesus in the Bible is where that faith is going to come into our hearts and where that faith is going to be strengthened. But how do we, how, can, so can we do that? Is that something we can do on our own? No, we need help. This is where the Holy Spirit comes in. He's the one who's going to work through that word to give us faith. In fact, 1 Corinthians 12, 3 says, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. You and I aren't, be, aren't able to believe in Jesus unless the Holy Spirit works through that word to bring us to faith. We need him to do this. This is what the Holy Spirit does for us. And he not only works through the word, he works through sacraments like baptism. Repent, and Acts 2 says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
That's the faith that he gives us through that gospel, through that powerful message, through the word and through baptism. And then Jesus sends his disciples out saying, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. So that's how you're going to do it. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That word in also could mean into. We're being baptized into the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And when you're brought into the name of someone, it means you've been adopted in their family. If you take on someone's name, you're becoming part of their family. And so that's what the Holy Spirit does for us. That's what um, being brought to faith in Jesus through baptism or through the word of God does for us. We're brought into God's family. And we look toward the end now, 1 John 3, 1. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that's what we are. Family. So we can just sum up what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit has ransomed us from being spiritual orphans and brought us into an eternally loving home and family. And that's how we, as spiritual orphans, can have optimism. Not just for tomorrow, but for today. Every single one of us was born with the desire to belong to a family which nothing can satisfy except being part of that family. So Jesus begins, our text today is going to be John 14, 18 to 27. That's where we're going to be today. And Jesus begins that text. He's comforting his disciples. Here's what he says to them. He says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Another well-known orphan would be Oliver Twist. In the story, Oliver Twist, Oliver was orphaned from birth when his mother died. Um, he was an illegitimate child, so father wasn't around. And so he grew up in an orphanage. And the orphanage where he lived was a, was a cruel, miserable, and awful place. And so Oliver draws the short straw, and he gets picked to go and ask for more food from the headmaster, which is a no-no. And so the headmaster then assigns Oliver uh, hard labor. He made him an apprentice, which means hard labor, um, just for asking for more food. And so Oliver, Oliver gets treated cruelly. He gets abused. He works long, long days. He's not fed. He gets beaten by the taskmaster. He gets beaten by the taskmaster's wife. He gets beaten by the other kids. Oliver wants to escape. Oliver wants to fix us. Oliver wants to change us. And finally, finally he does. Oliver escapes. He goes to London. He finds, a, finds another group of boys who are led by a man named Fagin. So hopefully, ah, yes, this will be better. But Oliver's best attempts to dig himself out of the hole he was born into only make that hole bigger, and only make that hole worse, because if you read this before, you heard the story, Fagin uh, was actually like a mobster who was using those boys as pickpockets and thieves to rob and steal all around London. So it wasn't better for Oliver now, it's worse. And so the more Oliver kept trying to improve his life and fix his life, the worse his life became broken. Oliver was trying to, he was trying to get himself out of the, of the situation he was in, but with his own attempts, he actually only made it worse. Can you relate? Have you been there? Do, do we sometimes do that in our own lives? Right? Our own attempts to fix things, our own attempts to make our lives better, the more we try to dig ourselves out of the hole um, that we're in, in our, with our own methods, um, often the bigger the mess we make out of our lives. So just looking at the main thought of today, we're all born with a desire to belong. That, because we're part of God's family. Like that we're born with that desire because we belong to, we, there's a family that we should belong to. So we're born with this desire to belong. And, and of course, we, we look for that belonging in, with, with our parents, our family. That makes sense. You know, until about the time we become teenagers, we grow up, and then all of a sudden that's not enough. And that, that belonging to mom and dad isn't, you know, that's not cool anymore. That's not enough anymore. So we start looking to our peers then. 
right? And our peer groups and certain groups at school that we want to be part of, that we want to be belong to, that we want uh, to think that we're cool or that we're part of them. And, and we, we just want so badly to belong. But then we get over it. No, we don't, do we? It, we that stays with us as grown-ups as we go into our adult life, our grown-up life. We still want to. We want to belong um, to certain groups of coworkers. We want to be part of a team. We want to be part of uh, certain groups of people, certain friend groups, certain groups in society. Um, whether it's social media group, like we, we always wanting to belong, and so we have this desire to belong, which nothing seems to satisfy. We are created by God. And as people created by God, we have the need to belong to God's family. It's the only thing that's going to satisfy that. But we try our own ways. We try our own ways to get out of it. We try our own ways to fix things. We try substituting other things, other people, other groups of people, and it never works. It never fixes it. So we're born into this world as spiritual orphans, not having a family, d- disconnected from the family that we should be part of, the, the one thing that actually would fill our need. And so just like Oliver in orphanage or Annie in orphanage, that makes our life cruel and miserable. That's why life is difficult here. That's why life is challenging. That's why we have things that we can't fix. That's why life is hard because we, we're, we have this longing and we try fixing it in all kinds of different ways instead of being part of that family, we try fixing it all kinds of different ways ourselves, but it never works. And the more we try fixing our own lives, the more, uh, the more difficult and messy things become. Our best isn't good enough. Whoever told you it was? <laughs> Walt Disney? Watch too many Disney movies? Of course, there are times in life where it is good for us to try our best and give our best, of course. Part of a school, part of a team, part of a work group. But we're talking spiritually. We're talking our life with God in, in as far as spiritual things go, as far as our spiritual life is trying to do our best, that, that works in other places in our life, trying to do our best isn't going to fill us up. It isn't going to give us what we need the most. We need to belong to God's family. We need to belong to God's family, which our sins separate us from, which our sin causes us to be born as spiritual orphans into this world. We need to belong to that family. Our sins separate us from that. So our best wasn't good enough. All our ways to try to fix it and, and, and bring us back, ourselves back into that family or find a different family that will work instead, all our best efforts aren't good enough. Our best was not good enough, but his was. His was. That's what Jesus did by living here and dying on that cross to, to remove the sins from our life, that, those iniquities that separate us from God and enable us to be part of God's family again. Our best wasn't good enough, but his was. Titus 3.5 says that he saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, uh-uh, but because of his mercy. He saved us through And here's now how it becomes ours. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. So he saved us by all Jesus did on that cross and resurrection for us. And that becomes ours by by that renewing and washing the Holy Spirit did for us when he brought us to faith and brought us into God's family, which we needed him to do. This is why the Holy Spirit's so important. Again, 1 Corinthians 12, 3, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So the point here is that we need help. We need God's help. We need the Holy Spirit's help. And that's why Jesus began our text by saying, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. God was never going to leave us alone to try our best. Jesus was never going to leave us alone to try to figure out our own way back to him. He sent us the Holy Spirit. That's how he comforted his disciples on this last night he got to spend with them. He promised them and assured them he was going to be sending them the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit adopts us as orphans into God's family. Just a couple more verses that just bring that thought home. 1 Peter 2 says, Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You know, once you were orphans without a family. 
You, you weren't par- part of anything. You didn't belong to anything. But now you're the people of God. Now you're the family of God. And 2 Thessalonians 2, but we ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters. This is what makes us brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord, because God chose you as first fruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief, belief in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel. That's the tool the Holy Spirit works. He called you to this through our gospel that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then Romans 8, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's orphans? No. That we are God's children. So let's get into our text with all of that intro. Um, First few verses, including verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in him, and I am in you. So the Holy Spirit makes us children of God's family, and no one can take that identity away from us. So we have been brought into God's family. That's what, we, that's what Matthew 28 taught us, that, that we're baptized into his name. We take on his name. We've been brought, we have been brought into God's family through faith in Jesus. Now, we are husbands and wives. We are parents and children. We are friends. We are employers. We are employees. We are teachers. We are students. And we can lose all of that in a second. All of those roles, all those things can be gone just like that. But being called by the Holy Spirit as a child into God's family? We can never lose that. That is an identity that is always yours. That is an identity that no one can take away from you. All these other things, all these other roles, um, all these other things on earth, all these other roles we play, all those things are temporary. All can be lost in a moment, but not this. This No matter what of those things you lose, no matter what of those things change, no matter what of those things get altered, this is always true, that you are part of God's family. He brought you in. And that identity can never be taken away from you. Uh, Family on earth can be lost. But this family can never be lost. Let's read more about it. Verses 21 to 24. Whoever has... My commands and and keeps them is the one who loves me, the one who loves me and will be loved by my Father. And I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. So when you're part of a family, you start taking on the character traits of that family, right? And when the Holy Spirit, uh, once the Holy Spirit makes us a child of God, once he makes us part of God's family, he starts empowering us to live as God's family. So we start loving like God loves. We start living like God lives. We, we, we want things um, to be in our lives that, that are in God's life. And we don't want stuff in our life that isn't part of God's life. We start, we start the Holy Spirit helps us start living and, and looking more like God. So the Holy Spirit fills us with the love that is going to power our obedience. He fills us with the love that drives and empowers how we live. Remember, I'm sure, you know, something like this has happened for you if you're a parent. Remember telling, at some point, telling your child to to clean their room? And two minutes later, they're like, done! You're like, really? (laughs) Are you sure? Yep. Can I come and look at it? Nope. Don't need to. Yeah, I think I do. And so you, you, you take their hand and you walk back in the room with them and you see the big pile of Legos right in the middle of the floor and you, and you like, do you see that pile of Legos over there? What pile? Oh, the one right in the middle of your floor, you see that? Oh, 
Does that belong there? No. Okay. What about the stuff that you've shoved under the bed? Does, is that where that goes? No. And so you, you take them by the hand and you, you help them understand why it's important as a member of the family to clean up their room, to, to do their part, to, to live in such a way that would be loving to everyone else around. So you, you come to them and you, help, you, you make your home with them. Jesus said, my father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. So through the Holy Spirit, our father and Jesus come to us and they make their home with us. Love drives obedience. As we're filled with that love, we want to be like them. We want to live like them. We want to obey them. And so the Holy Spirit's saying to you, um, what are you struggling with? And you're like, nothing. And the Holy Spirit's like, really? Can I come and show you what's on the floor? You're like, no. And the Holy Spirit's going to say, yeah, I need to. I need to because it's for your good. Because you're part of the family now. And so that's what the Holy Spirit does, not, not, just, not by whispering in your ear, but by speaking through the word. The Holy Spirit speaking through the word convicts us. He convicts us. So it, through the word, he, he shows us things in our lives that we need to clean up that we didn't see before even if they were right in front of our faces. He convicts us and shows us the stuff we need to clean up that we didn't see. He comes and he makes his home with us. He makes our home with us. Now, we aren't obedient so that he will love us. We are loved by him. And that love, that love powers our obedience. That love motivates our obedience. That love gives us a reason to be obedient. That love gives us a reason to to make our home with him, to be part of the family. Let's take the last verses of our text, 25 to 27. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. So the Holy Spirit is one who stirs up the love in our hearts that, that drives our obedience. And he does that through the word of God. He does that by he's teaching us all things and he reminds us of everything that Jesus said. And the Holy Spirit does all of this through the word of God. This is his tool for giving us faith and for strengthening our faith. This is his tool for creating faith in our hearts and strengthening that faith. The Holy Spirit is always, through the word, he's always pointing us to Jesus. The word is always pointing us to Jesus. The word the, through the, which the Holy Spirit is working through is always, he's, it's always saying, here, here's Jesus. Here's what Jesus did for you. And that's how he teaches us to live in a way that, that thanks and honors Jesus. See, we tend to forget about God's faithfulness yesterday and complain about today, right? So the Holy Spirit reminds us. <laughs> he reminds us of God's faithfulness. And when he reminds us of how faithful God is, that's what brings us peace. And that's how he can give us a peace that the world can't give us. The world cannot give us that peace. The world says, this ship is unsinkable, but it sank. The world says, this building is unshakable, but it fell. The world says this, this plan for your children is unbeatable, but it didn't work. The world can't make promises that actually help us live and walk in peace. And that's what the Holy Spirit does by reminding us of Jesus' faithfulness. The Holy Spirit reminds us of the faithfulness of Jesus so we can actually walk in the peace that Jesus brings. Your best isn't good enough. My best isn't good enough. And God needs us to learn that the hard way so we'll actually go to him. And I think that we can do it on ourselves or by ourselves. But God says to us, you're not enough, but I am. You're not enough, but I am. And that, that alone brings us peace. Why? Why? Because we fail. 
We fall short. We disappoint. We mess up. And if peace, our peace was going to depend on our performance or how well we do, we'd never have peace. Our peace depends on him who is enough, always. So we fail. I mean, parents, anyone blow it this week? Lose your patience. Not as loving as you could be. Uh, spouses, husbands, wives, anyone hurt each other this week? Single people, coworkers, students, teachers, anyone make mistakes this week? We're not good on our own. We need help. We need help. I mean, we can, we can, frantic, we can frantically pursue trying to be better and wear ourselves out, or we can just rest in God, who is enough. We can rest in the peace that, that he brings us. We can rest in the peace that Jesus brings us through the Holy Spirit, the gospel, the good news that God sees his perfection in us. God sees no sin in us. God loves us and adores us and can't wait to spend eternity with us. That is what brings us peace. That's the gospel. And that's what the Holy Spirit does for us by reminding us of the faithfulness of Jesus. Because everything we do out in that world, everything we, everything we run into, every challenge that faces us wants us to forget about God's faithfulness and think that we have to fix things. And so the Holy Spirit keeps pointing us to Jesus. A couple chapters later in John 16, Jesus says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you'll have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. That's what the Holy Spirit reminds us of. That's what he does for us. So we believe in the Holy Spirit. He adopted us from being orphans into God's family. He brought us to to faith in Jesus and made us sons and daughters of God, his family. He, He made his home with us. He shapes and molds us with the love of God to live like God. He he strengthens our faith by by teaching us and reminding us of Jesus in the Word. And he gives us the peace that the world cannot give us. So the more we learn about Jesus, the more we remember the faithfulness of Jesus— the more we're able to walk in the peace that Jesus brings. Where is is fear stopping you right now from being the person the Holy Spirit is making you to be? Just ponder that a moment in your life. I want you to be thinking about that. Where is fear stopping you, holding you back, from being the person the Holy Spirit is enabling you to be as he reminds you of the faithfulness of Jesus. I want to end on these, on, on this, these verses right here um, to give you something to walk out of here with today. Romans 8, 14, 15 say, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him, by the Holy Spirit, by him we cry, Abba, Father. So we've been adopted as God's children. We get to call him Abba, meaning Daddy. We get to call him Daddy or Papa or Dad, all right? Abba is a term of endearment. It's like what you call your dad or Papa or Daddy, But not only is Abba a term of endearment, it's a term of power. Because we get to call him Abba, we get to call him Dad. That's my dad. That's my dad. Do you know what he has done? Do you know what he's capable of doing? That's my dad. Remember when you were little, and you thought your dad could, like, beat anybody, right? My dad can beat up your dad, right? That that was the thing we always had on the playground. My dad's stronger than your dad. My dad can beat up your dad. You knew your dad was the strongest thing in the universe. Well, by the Holy Spirit, you and I are sons and daughters of God Almighty. He 
he's our dad. So we don't live and walk around in a spirit of fear anymore, in a spirit of timidity. We don't walk around through life afraid. We walk around in a spirit of power. Can anything separate us from the love of God? Are you kidding? That's my dad. You think I'm afraid of you? Are you kidding me? That's my dad. You think I'm uh, afraid of this or that? Are you kidding? That's my dad. I'm not, I'm not worried about this. I'm not scared about that. Because he's my dad. And have you seen what my dad can do? That's my dad. And that's what the Holy Spirit reminds us of. He reminds us who our dad is. So, oh, yes, I believe in the Holy Spirit. He is the illuminator of scriptures. He is the one who reminds me who my dad is. He's the one who opens our hearts to believe in Jesus as our Savior through the word of God. He fills us with love for Jesus. He enables us to live lives that are fitting and thankful. And he's the one who reminds us who our dad is. He's the one who reminds us of Jesus' faithfulness so that we can walk in peace.